for show and tell. The title will be Mockingbird Songs, My Friendship with Harper Lee. Uh, the title page will be embossed with the outline of Harper Lee's home state and the words Harper Lee's home state. Since the embossing probably doesn't show up very well, we have the original design in black and white and we'll demonstrate today. The limited edition will be signed by Wayne Flint on publication date, May 2nd, and has a certificate of authentication with each book. You may purchase your copy today on our website. And now, we are honored to introduce Wayne Flint. Wayne, thank you so much for coming. I know yesterday, you uh, shared the podium with John Grisham, and here you are today with us. Thank yeah, you. he was talking about Harper Lee and the law, and I talked about Harper Lee and Christianity and theology. So it, was a, it was a tandem duo. <laughs> well, he's not downstairs by the No, chance, no, he? he flew back to God's country in Virginia. Wayne, will you please, for our folks viewing, uh, dispel the myths, rumors, and misconceptions about Harper Lee first, was she demented and manipulated when she published Watchmen? Uh, she was as clear-headed as I am, uh, <laughs> which is not to say a whole lot. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, people have memory problems when they reach my age, uh, certainly when they reached her age, which was 12 years older than my age. But uh, she was fully capable of giving informed consent one of the brightest people I have ever known. She could quote Shakespeare uh, at great length, quote the Bible at great length, did so constantly and did so till the day she died. And the evidence of her mental capacity is not only that uh, she had the complete works of C.S. Lewis sitting on her ottoman, <laughs> but when I saw them sitting on her ottoman, I said, Nell, I didn't know you were a C.S. Lewis fan, and she was profoundly deaf and uh, had macular degeneration, so she couldn't see or hear you very well. So she said, uh, who? And I said, C.S. Lewis. She said, who? And I said, C.S. Lewis. I didn't know you liked C.S. Lewis. She said, greatest a Christian apologist of the 20th century. Mere Christianity was the greatest book of apologetics since Augustine. Wow, well, well let me ask you, I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you that I know the audience would like to hear. Was she a hermit? Oh no, she was not a hermit at all. Uh, she was a very social person, but a very private person. And a lot of people think you can't be both. But that's one reason she became such a hermit at the end of her life, Jake, because she could not see people, therefore she didn't know who they were by sight. She couldn't hear people except for me on the right side of her face, 10 inches from her ear. Everybody else was required to write with a, a, a sharp old pen on a big piece of a butcher paper, which was a terrible way to communicate with a human being. And as a result of that, and her embarrassment at having people she knew in Monroe will constantly come to her assisted living when she didn't know who they were, couldn't figure out who they were, couldn't hear where they were, who they were. And so gradually her attorney, Tanya Carter, restricted access because it was humiliating for, for her. Understand? Well, you have told me every time we speak about that lady that she had such an incredible sense of humor. Would you share one story with our audience about her sense of humor? Sure. Uh, my favorite story literally occurred a few months before she died when the New York Times and other newspapers and outlets were talking about her dementia. And uh, one of her supposed friends complained to the Department of Human Resources about how she this was an example of elder abuse that <laughs> was happening to her by her lawyer and others, manipulators, and some included me and some didn't, but uh, I generally was left out of her manipulators. Uh, we went to a production of King Lear, her favorite play, oh. the Alabama Shakespeare play, uh, uh, theater, which privately she funded completely, the entire oh, performance series for weeks. No one knew that. No one knew that. 
She, she never went out of her way, nor did her sister Alice, to promote their own philanthropy, which was enormous. But at any rate, we're in the patron's lounge, we go to the play. She's in there in a wheelchair with Joy Brown, her best friend, who had given her the money to uh, transform Watchmen into Mockingbird in New York City. Uh, Joy is trying to explain to her what's happening on stage, since she can't hear or see. She's repeating the lines of the actors, but it may be act two, not act one. It may not be. She kept saying, who's on stage? And of course, Joy Brown, who was not conversant with King Lear, had no idea which character it was on stage. So the noise gets louder and louder until finally it's disturbing the actors who are hearing their lines from act two in act one or hearing someone else's lines when they're trying to remember their lines. So uh, Joy wheels her out to the painter's lounge, and as she's leaving, she says, why are you taking me out? <laughs> we go to the painter's lounge at the intermission to stay with her during the second act so others can go. And I go to her wheelchair, and since I never treated her like a marble lady, and she never treated me like a marble man, we insulted each other constantly. I'm thinking, King Lear is a mad king, right? That's the theme of the play, a mad king. So I walk in to the Fetters Lounge, get out on one knee in front of her wheelchair, and I said, now you could be King Lear. And she, she looks at me like that, and like that, Jack, she says, and you could be my fool. <laughs> to the hilarious laughter of, I am reduced to a, an idiot on one knee oh in front of her wheelchair God. being insulted by the great writer. And the next week, we go down to Monroe. I said, Neil, I've been thinking about that. What you said last week, you remember that I said you, you could be King Lear and that I could be your fool? I just want you to remember that in Shakespeare, the fool's always smarter than the king. And she laughed because it was a wonderful repast. And she said, it only took you one week to think of that. <laughs> oh, that man, is her humor. That Brilliant is, humor. That's so good. Thank you for sharing uh, that. Uh, I, I have read the book and I'm just blown away. And I know everybody in America and Australia and England and everywhere uh, is going to want that book. That, Thank you for sharing those stories that you just did today. And oh my goodness, thanks for the book. It's, well, it's our book of the year, and we're so pleased that you came. Before you leave, if we might impose, your book ends with the complete eulogy that you uh, wrote and delivered at Harper Lee's funeral. May we ask you to take us out of this show by reading maybe the first and second and last and last paragraphs of that eulogy uh, from the podium. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. What a treat. We gather today to honor a person, a writer, her father, her family, her novel, and that is a bit more than I can manage in 15 minutes. So I'll stick with the novel, but it might help us all to remember that we are honoring both a person and a writer, and they are different. Persons have a right to be persons separate from being writers. The endurance of To Kill a Mockingbird has lots to do with the narrative of the novel, but it also resides in the immense half-century debate we've had in America about education, and especially about moral values in education. Should public schools teach values? If so, what values? Whose values? Actually, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of school teachers have answered that question a long time ago. They decided to teach Harper Lee's values, or is it Atticus Finch's values? At any rate, they teach the moral values embedded 
in To Kill a Mockingbird. And at our best, I like to think that they teach our values, core Judeo-Christian values, American democratic values, tolerance, kindness, civility, charity, justice, the courage to face down a community or a family when they're wrong, and the compassion to love them despite their flaws. Incidentally, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. How do I know that? Because there was a survey of English teachers in 1989 to determine what fiction they most frequently assigned to their students. In Catholic schools, To Kill a Mockingbird was the fourth most frequently assigned book. In public schools, the novel made it in fifth place. In private schools, seventh. An estimated three out of four of every American high school students, no matter what school they attended, read to Kill a Mockingbird for an entire generation. That ranked Harper Lee behind only William Shakespeare, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Mark Twain as the most influential and popular authors in the lexicon of American literature and British literature. A 1991 Library of Congress survey of 5,000 people asked them what book had made the biggest difference in their lives. The Bible was number one. To Kill a Mockingbird came in second. In 1991, American librarians voted To Kill a Mockingbird the best novel of the 20th century. The American Film Institute rated the film version of To Kill a Mockingbird as the 34th best film ever made and in 2003, they chose Atticus Finch as the greatest hero of American cinema. Greater than James Bond. Greater than Indiana Jones. Greater than Moses. Greatest even than Superman. In 1999, TV Guide rated the movie fifth among the top 50 films. And even now, the Library of Congress claims that the novel is the most popular to educate an entire community on common values among the people. In one of those fine moments of irony for which Alabama is renowned, a novel written by a woman from Monroe on the edge of the state's infamous Black Belt has become the primary literary instrument worldwide for teaching values of racial justice and tolerance for people who are different from ourselves and the necessity of moral courage in the face of community prejudice and ostracism. I think Alabamians just love that irony. <laughs>